Welcome to the Nicolera Show. This is the place where we explore big ideas with people having a big impact on our world. I'm your host, Nick Hilera, serial entrepreneur, author, early morning riser, and seeker of truth and wisdom. Join me as we explore the journeys and discoveries of fascinating people who are literally unlocking the secrets to creating a life of both success and fulfillment. Each episode will arm you with insights, ideas, and practical perspectives on what it takes not only to be financially and personally successful, but also how to start having authentic impact on the world around you. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to The Nick Calera Show. I hope you all have been enjoying our summer finance series. This week, we are welcoming another incredibly interesting guest. We are joined by legendary financial journalist Martin Wolf, the chief economics commentator for the Financial Times, for a deep dive discussion about his rather important new book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. This is a book I'm highly recommending for you all, and my gut is telling me that you'll feel the same after you listen to this episode. I'm so honored to have Martin on the show as he's literally one of the most respected, sought-after thinkers in the world today. If he's not busy writing his ever-popular Financial Times columns or a new book, you'll find him doing things like advising world leaders, both in business and politics, on the most important issues of the day, or addressing universities and important international bodies like the World Bank and the IMF. You'd be hard-pressed to find a more thoughtful, connected, and influential individual in the world today. What you are about to hear is our incredible conversation about the crisis of democratic capitalism. We discuss what the crisis is, how we got here, and what might happen next. We also get into some really interesting historical discussions and look at how things today compare to dynamics in the late Roman Republic, which, as you all know, failed rather famously. This is an important episode and I'm sure is going to leave you all with a lot to think about. Hope you enjoy. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Nick Hilera Show. This week, we are joined by Martin Wolf, one of the most respected financial minds in the world, a longtime financial journalist for the Financial Times, and the author of a very important new book called The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. Martin, welcome to the show. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I've been so excited about this conversation. I spent a good part of the last month uh, reading your book and listening to many of your sort of recent uh, public appearances. And I realized that, you know, not only do we share a passion for the subject matter of the book, which is Democrat d- democracy and capitalism, but also for ancient history. And I thought maybe a fun place to start this conversation would be to go there because I feel like there, there's a, there's a theme in underlying the book, which you talk about a little bit in the book, but you don't go at length, which is that America looks very similar to another famous republic that failed famously. And uh, I'm curious to just get your perspective on where in that evolution uh, you think we are. You know, is are we close to a Caesar or are we more like in the Catiline conspiracy or are we even farther back in the, the Marius and Sulla period? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, It so happens, um, and then I'll go back to my personal history, that the first time I really, really was thinking about this was in early 2016 and uh, and, uh, with the rise of Donald Trump, which was uh, a bit of a surprise uh, for me. I I realized fairly early, earlier than most of my friends, including well-informed American friends, that this man could win the presidency. Uh, And in um, March 2016, I wrote what turned out to be, I think, one of my more prescient columns. And it was called um, How Donald Trump is How Great Republics Meet Their End. And I discussed the institution of the presidency, what it was created to do, and in, and how um, Donald Trump was more or less perfectly designed to destroy the country by seizing this um, office. And we can discuss how far he did and what it meant later. But in the process, I read Alexander Hamilton's uh, two very important federal Federalist Papers uh, essays, essays uh, uh, one of which was on the institution of the presidency 
and the other of which was on the Electoral College. The Electoral College one was very interesting because it perfectly explained how, in his view, the Electoral College would prevent the emergence of someone whom he describes in quite some detail, which is exactly like Donald Trump. But the presidency was even more interesting because, as I learned, and I pointed out this in my column, it was modeled on a version of the the Roman um, institution of the dictatorship, which was somebody you give exceptional power to, actually power of life and death, in an emergency. But he said, we're going to need something like this, but with fewer powers, of course, but still an, uh, uh, um, an energetic executive. I don't know if that's the phrase, but that's what I remember. Um, permanently. And that's what the presidency will provide us with. That's why we want the president um, as an active executive. And he, I thought it was very interesting that he he went back to this Roman institution. Now, uh, that then uh, led to this column. And the big idea here was, was, uh, was this. Um, uh, I studied um, the ancient languages at school and university. I read classics, and uh, which is basically Latin and ancient Greek. So I read a lot of this stuff, and I and I did quite a bit of ancient history. And of course, as was also true for the founding fathers of America, who were extremely well informed and well educated in ancient history, they debated around the lessons of what had happened to the Roman Republic uh, and its collapse. And the Roman Republic was clearly the most successful. Republican um, uh, effort, exercise in world history prior to the American one. And the American founding fathers were very well informed about its history and collapse. Of course, the Romans created a different set of institutional constraints, which I don't want to go into now, to make their republic safe. Hey, everybody, we had a little uh, technical glitch, but we're back and we're going to resume the conversation. Martin was just telling us about the relationship between what's happening in America today and, and some historical antecedents in Rome and, and Athens. So, Martin, please continue. So the Roman Republic ultimately collapsed um, because of the the disappearance of the Roman peasantry, the, if you like, the Roman middle class, and the, the arrival of competing plutocrats uh, scrub, who were, in fact, also generals. Now, there's another element to this, and then there's a really interesting sort of uh, lesson. The, the other element of this is the rise of the demagogues. There were, of course, very significant demagogues too in the Roman story. Uh, it was part of the sort of civil war environment of the last century before the death of the Republic. But there, there's also very much this example in the uh, Athenian democracy of the 5th century BC, and Plato in particular in The Republic, the first great work of political philosophy, discussed at length how the demagogue arrives in, with the argument that you need me to protect you from all these evil forces around you. I am the protector. And if you give me um, essentially unlimited trust and unlimited power, I will look after you. Uh, ordinary people against your enemies. And again, points out that's a sort of pretty standard demagogic trope. And that was again, of course, repeated in as part of the struggle in the Roman, um, in the collapse of the Roman Republic. What was the thing that I think was particularly striking about the, um, the story of the Republic, and which I pointed out in this column, is that when Octavian um, called himself Augustus and became the first emperor of Rome. All the institutions of the Republic were formally preserved. There was still the Senate. There was still uh, uh, consuls. Um, uh, but the powers of the consul were given to him. Uh, he, uh, he, they had, a, as it were, the appearance of a republic without the reality. What emerged and said was the military dictatorship we call the empire. And, uh, and this is very important for what's been happening to democracy across much of the world. You can, you can preserve all the formal institutions 
You can still have elections. You can still have parliaments. You can still have a judiciary. You can have laws. Um, but without effective independence in their operation, um, they can be robbed of all meaning. And I think that's the great lesson which we can take from the Republic. Once people no longer really believe in the institutions of the Republic, they don't believe they're part of one single citizenship, body of citizens, which is what happened in the Republic. Um, and uh, once they accept the arrival of a, a dictator, um, a figure with these extraordinary powers, as the natural way to rule their society, even if the institutions, the ancient institutions in some sense exist formally, they no longer have a meaning and you're, you move into a dictatorship. And it seemed to me very, very obvious that Donald Trump was running to be a dictator, not because he had a program. That's not what a dictator necessarily has. What a dictator says, I am above the law. The institutions of the state should do what I want. Uh, and I will use this power, I promise you faithfully, on your behalf, uh, um, my loyal voters, uh, loyal supporters, whatever. And that seems to me the echo that we are seeing, or an echo we are seeing from these past stories, in which the reality becomes dictatorial, while the, we still go through the pretense that it's a parliamentary democracy or a democracy of some kind. Right. And we, we have examples, actually, in, which you mentioned in the book, contemporary, quote unquote, democracies, where this is already happening, right? Like Turkey and uh, some couple other places where they, they're holding elections, but they're not real elections. And uh, It's becoming... Questionable and interesting question about India. Well, we don't know yet, but yes, you have the apparatus of of elections, um, and even some, you know, sometimes even almost a state sponsored opposition. But it's not real; it's theatre. The reality is more or less absolute power in the hands of um, of the ruler. And of course, it is worth remembering that in the sort of almost perfect example of the homage of vice to virtue, the communist regimes always had elections, but they always won by what, 99% or whatever it was. So the, the institution of election doesn't mean anything unless opposition is real, unless uh, there are independent election commissions, unless, uh, unless oppositions have, have the ability to mobilize the resources to fight an election. Uh, the democracy is a very subtle, a liberal democracy is a very subtle system. And an illiberal democracy is what people can't say talk, talk about. is really just a, a euphemism for a dictatorship. Yeah, and you make a really good point about this in the book, about how one of the features of democracy or one of the ways in which you can tell whether you're in a democracy that's functioning where one, one, one that's maybe not is the extent to which the losing party or the losing side of an election is willing to be governed, to see themselves as part of the same nation or same country and, and not just throw their hands up and say, I don't, you know, I'm not going to follow the laws. This is all BS. And I feel like America is dangerously close to that, where essentially the, the losing side of these elections feels like everyone in power is out to get them now. And whether or not that's true is another question, but certainly you get that feeling. And I think it's an important point. I think it is a crucial point. So let's go back and sort of thought, think to ourselves, what is democracy about? What does it mean? And the, when you start thinking about it, it's quite weird. I mean, it, it, we've got used to the idea this is sort of a natural or normal way to govern ourselves, but it isn't... It, either historically or logically so. Historically, most regimes, nearly all regimes, that have governed moderately complex societies have been uh, autocracies or oligarchies or some combination of the two. So uh, power is in the hands of a king, a monarch, what you rebelled against in America in the 18th century, or in the hands of a 
of an oligarchy, usually a landowning aristocracy historically. They, they, they basically control all the wealth of society, principally land in uh, pre-modern societies. And because they control all the land and therefore all the wealth, they control all the power. And that's the end of it. Wealth equals power. Power equals wealth. And most people are expected to do what they're told. And if they don't, they get killed. I mean, that's, in essence, how societies worked. Peasant revolts might happen, but everybody got killed. Not everybody. Enough to keep them in order and the rest were sent back to work. Now, democracy is a remarkably different structure, as we've discussed. Uh, though the Roman Republic wasn't a full democracy, it had democratic elements, and Athens was remarkably democratic, of course, with a limited franchise, no women, no slaves. But the point is, that was a rarity, real rarity. Now, we created, uh, we in the West, over the last 200, 250 years or so, something quite different. Um, and a very big part of the book is discussing why and how that happened. We can perhaps get to that. But the, the, the key point is operating within an already established framework, particularly in England, which then, of course, got into other countries like the US. Um, we had the idea of representatives being elected and sent to Parliament. So you, know, you like the framework for a representative democracy and over time, an increasing proportion of the population demanded um, a vote. And so voting became universal. We got universal suffrage in most Western societies about 100 years ago or so. And in this structure, what we were saying is, first, that wealth and power are not the same thing. You can be powerful by virtue of winning elections. And uh, if you won elections, you own power and within the constitution there were always constitutions as there was very much in rome you were entitled to to do what you thought were right was right and uh, so you've got lots of people who are not in the least wealthy in power I mean, take an american case one of the most extraordinary examples is abraham lincoln who came from nothing as it were he had no wealth uh, he was a uh, I think a prairie lawyer, I mean, he was a lawyer anyway, and uh, he won elections and he became president he, and he held enough power to uh, fight the Civil War and win it. So that's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Uh, that's a different way of allocating power. Wealth and power are not the same thing. And the other thing that is extraordinary about this system that emerged is, as you say, you vote for who leads the country who has political power, and as a result of the votes, which in, in a universal suffrage election, everybody has an equal vote, um, so rich and poor all have one vote, and the, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the exceptions to this, and you accept that whoever wins is legitimate, uh, and when he or she is in power, they have to accept your legitimacy, your right to campaign against them, to to but while they're there, they're legitimate. And for that to happen, you have to have a in some sense an overriding loyalty to the political community as a whole, which is greater than your lo loyalty to your own side. Uh, I think of uh, I've described a democracy as a civilized civil war. What makes it civilized? is the willingness to accept that you've lost and that the other side are legitimate rulers while they, you know, during their term of office. And your patriotic duty is to support them because they are also legitimately part of the constitutional arrangement and the political reality of your society. And that takes something very, it's a very sophisticated and complicated idea. In other words, as I put it, patriotism, a shared patriotism, is essential, is a necessary condition for a working democracy. And I give the wonderful uh, example in Britain where we call the opposition the loyal opposition for that very reason. They are, they are yes, they may be the opponents, but they are not the enemy. It's very important that your political opponents are not the enemy. Now, of course, as I argue, coming to your very interesting question, if uh, somebody who loses the election does not accept 
the, the legitimacy of the loss, does not accept the legitimacy of the process which brought about his loss, and does not accept the legitimacy of his replacement, those fundamental norms that make this a functioning democracy are being attacked. Absolutely clearly and definitively attacked. In my view, this is an insurrectionary act against the democratic order. And that has, of course, as I point out, this is hardly novel in, at all, uh, been the case with um, the, the loser from the last presidential election in the US, uh, Donald Trump, and with um, the support of uh, not just of the people in the party who are most passionately loyal to, to him, but also pretty well all the senior officials of the party. And that means that they do not accept the legitimacy of elections, which they haven't won. And in that case, absolutely fundamental norms of democracy no longer operate. And in the particular consequence of that, one would expect from experience elsewhere, is that if and when they get into power, they will use that power to make sure they can't lose again, because it's not legitimate for them to lose. And, of course, if the entire machinery of a state is in the hands of people who want to use it to ensure they can never lose again, well, by and large, they succeed. And you don't have a democracy anymore. You have a dictatorship. Yeah, and I think it's, it's such a great point. And it's one that many Americans, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for this, but mostly Americans don't study history. But there's actual, like, very contemporary historical precedent for democracies being taken over by exactly that evolutionary phenomenon. You know, Germany being the most stark example where Hitler is a democratically elected individual who very quickly assumes complete control of his country. And then we all know what happened after that. That's, of course, an extreme example. And people will say, well, that's not really where we are. But in fact, if you look at other societies where this is going on, if you have a leader who wins an election and has a parliament which supports him, Congress in your case, but a parliament, so he can make the laws, he can appoint the judiciary, he can appoint, obviously, all the ministers, he can appoint the people who run the Department of Justice and the tax service and, of course, the military. Uh, and they're all loyal to him personally. And that's their overriding loyalty because that's why they've selected, been selected. And they can dismiss any of the officials or judges uh, who disagree with their version of reality. Then it really isn't terribly difficult to turn this into a dictatorship. It doesn't need to be as extreme as the Nazi version, but it can be quite good enough. Uh, to become permanent rule. And in all truth, I mean, it does, if you're an American, it seems to me it's not very difficult to imagine this sort of process because essentially that's how the South was run uh, from uh, pretty well from the Civil War till uh, the Civil Rights Movement of the, of the 1960s. And that is to say a very large portion of the potential electorate was effectively disenfranchised, and there was permanent one-party rule. And it, it took outside intervention to change this, and only partially successfully. So the key point here is that once uh, certain outcomes in a democracy are regarded as illegitimate by those who hold power, they believe they must, as an existential matter, permanently control power because they see their opponents as fundamentally evil, uh, anti-national, uh, uh, un-American, whatever, then pretty quickly democracy will disappear. And in, for example, in the podcast we did on this, I talked about this at great length with Larry Diamond, who's a very leading American scholar of uh, democracy. And of course, he made clear that these, there are many, many examples of this in history, and there are quite a few examples today. What I would, would have thought 10 years ago is that it, this was inconceivable, really, in the United States, 
because I believe that the 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 acceptance that there was a common set of norms binding Americans together and a mutual a common loyalty to the institutions of the republic and to the belief that all Americans are in some profound way equal. But if that doesn't exist anymore, then democracy is in terrible trouble. And I've argued on pre- frequent occasions, I am not don't know what will happen, but it doesn't seem to me very difficult to imagine that uh, assumption of power uh, by some of the candidates, particularly Mr. Trump at the next election, with a different set of supporters and a more radical program, which is clearly there, that um, immense damage could be done to the core institutions of uh, the American Republic. And I don't honestly believe that the current Supreme Court would do much to prevent it. Yeah. Hey, guys, this is Nick. I wanted to take a quick break from the episode to share some exciting news. In addition to the podcast, I want to make you aware of some additional content we're putting out. And best of all, it's 100% free. Our Profit Plus newsletter consists of weekly insights about what it takes to find meaning in the pursuit of modern success. This is the place where we explore big ideas at the intersection of markets, business, politics, and life as we seek to empower our readers to have an authentic impact on the world. If you're serious about finding fulfillment amid success, then definitely check out these additional insights. Just go to subscribe.nickhilaris.com. Again, that's subscribe.nickhilaris.com. Now let's get back to the episode. This whole line of thinking is fascinating to me. Like, I, I, just getting back to the Roman example, you know, th- this phenomenon appeared to be happening in Rome for a while, and it's the and the comparison between America and Rome is is really interesting because they won a, essentially a huge world war. You know, they fought two world wars. They won the second one decisively and became absolute master of the world for their region. They became fantastically wealthy, and then all of a sudden. Wealth inequality spiraled out of control, and demagogues started to appear on the scene. And it was only until somebody who was charismatic enough and capable enough to inspire the confidence of members of the military, essentially, that you get a Caesar. And so, like what we saw in my view with Trump is is sort of like the early early runs in Rome, where these people just weren't that competent and they weren't that charismatic and they couldn't inspire their their own people to turn against another set of their own people. But it wouldn't take much. You just need somebody really charismatic and competent who's actually offering a new vision of prosperity that people believe in. And it, these kind of things could happen. It, it wouldn't take much more than that. I think the, the, the story is a bit more complicated than they had to wait for the somebody sufficiently charismatic. I think they had to wait for somebody sufficiently ruthless. Uh, and the, I mean, it seems to me pretty clear that Sulla, uh, an earlier version, um, he he actually just abdicated. Uh, and, uh, it basically, it took them a while, which may be very relevant to the American experience, I hope so, before somebody had the nerve to actually do this. Uh, most of you know, the people who were fighting these wars were Romans, um, aristocrats and plebeians. There was, that was very much the division in politics uh, to the extent there was an ideological s- split, and there was one. Uh, the, uh, but they shared the belief in the fundamental premises of the Roman Republic and the Roman experience so they were, they were with this intense hostility in Rome to the idea of another king. That is what they were associated with, because the Roman Republic was created very much like the American Republic to get rid of monarchy, um, and the and the, it was seen as be, you know becoming a king was just really not acceptable. Which is, by the way, in the end, they never called themselves kings, and uh, they didn't use the word rex. Uh, the the um, so the. Uh, and I think up to Caesar, probably Julius Caesar, no one really had the nerve, though they certainly had the power. Um, Marius did too; he didn't live long enough. But the the uh, to actually establish a permanent uh, dictatorial structure, and even with Caesar, who was on the dictator for life thing, he didn't really work out. We wouldn't, don't know what would have happened if he hadn't been assassinated. 
an institutional structure for this new empire. Augustus was a political genius. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And he worked out a framework which would give the appearance that Rome was still Rome while giving himself all the relevant power. So he made himself consul for life, as I said. He made himself uh, directly in charge of all the provinces of the empire which had any soldiers in them. There were only half the, 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 um, the rest would get left to the senatorial class, which meant there were lots of goodies for them. Uh, uh, he didn't directly sort of uh, say, my, my, my word is law. That happened later in the empire. He was very, very subtle. So if you really wanted to be blind enough, uh, you could pretend nothing had happened. But of course, by then, there'd been a hundred years of turmoil, bloodshed, war. People were fed up with the wars. They wanted peace and stability. Now, that's not where you are in, in America. It's very, very different. You do have peace and stability, and people aren't fed up with it. So in that sense, if this is going to happen, it's a very early process. I don't think anyway, you, you know, your billionaires are not generals, and your generals, with the exception possibly of MacArthur, famous case, have never shown the slightest desire to seize power. So you've got a very different structure. I really think it's very important to be aware of the, the great differences. But it doesn't have to go that way. You could still imagine somebody becoming president, which is an office that didn't exist in Rome and would give them immense power. The, the presidency, if it's really exploited ruthlessly, can be used to extraordinary effect, but in wartime or something that can be called an emergency. Uh, and you can do what these more recent uh, cases have done, we've discussed, namely hollow out all the independent institutions, make the people who are in charge of them essentially your own uh, servants, uh, expect uh, personal um, personal loyalty. And it would probably take two or three terms consecutively, so you'd need some continuity. But you could establish a, more, a pretty effective form of modern dictatorship without actually going through the civil war process that the Romans did. The key point, I think, is, is the one you touched upon. Um, once people who are in power believe they must not lose power because the other side are basically a traitors, essentially worthless people with ideas which will subvert everything that is decent and good, then you've got politics of civil war, and it's really hard to sustain the, the basic comity among the citizens which supports democracy. So it wouldn't be exactly the same. This is a, a key point. Of course, you Rome was a very different society with very different institutions, um, and it took a, a very long time. But once the the solid peasant class was turned into impoverished soldiers. Um, which is really what happened, uh, and the and they lived and depended on the their patronage by these generals. Um, then the, the Roman Republic, I think, was um, essentially essentially doomed. Um, and this will be very different now. Of course, it will. But these republican experiments, as the as the founding fathers of America were very aware, these are fragile. Creations. They demand extraordinary restraint, self restraint among the powerful and wealthy. Uh, and if they don't feel that loyalty, they don't feel that commitment. Um, and if the people who are, as it were, the active agents in political organizations don't feel that commitment, then democracy is extremely difficult to sustain. And what seems to me to be happening when I look at the recent years, which you, you've been talking about, is that has been happening in the U.S. Uh, the, the, uh, and the very fact, to, to me, was so symbolic that Donald Trump did not attend the inauguration of Joe Biden, which is about as strong a statement as you can make, is symbolically of the highest order. Um, and yet he is still the most likely presidential candidate for the Republican Party in the next election. I don't think anybody, unless they're completely blind, can look at this and think, well, actually, our democ our republic is safe. Yeah. 
Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. This episode of The Nick Hilera Show is brought to you by Metro's Capital. If you're an investor looking for direct access to real estate investments, then we'd love to talk with you. Investment opportunities at Metro's Capital balance financial returns and community impact. To learn more, contact us at metros.nickhilaris.com. Again, that's metros.nickhilaris.com. Now let's get back to the episode. I could talk about Rome all day with you, but there's there's at least two other super important points in your book that I want to get out before we uh, run out of time. Uh, so I'd like I think feel like this is a good time to turn to one of those, which is at, in the book you you describe how there's this sort of symbiotic relationship between the rise of uh, liberal capitalism and universal suffrage, uh, and make a very well articulated and documented argument to suggest that the challenge that we've just been talking about that is manifested politically is a consequence of what you coin or what you call rentier capitalism. And so that if there's two sides of the deal, which is freedom and, and prosperity or, or capitalist freedom, however you want to characterize it, one side of it is failing really poorly in, in creating a conditions of wealth inequality, income inequality, and all these sort of plutocratic consequences. And, and that is the true source of all this political stuff that you and I just spent you know, half an hour talking about. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Yes, I think there are many different views on this. And I think it's a bit more complicated than that. But I, I let me go to that uh, part. Um, and here I will, uh, uh, I'll do two things. First, I will refer to another ancient thinker um, who ha- captured this more, better, I think, than anybody else. And that was Aristotle, who was after the first political scientist, if you like, and, and in his book, Politics. Uh, in which he, among other things, makes the very important remark, um, which I've thought about so much in my life, which is that man or human beings actually is a polit- are political animals. We are es- essentially social, and in our larger life, that means we do politics. And the question is, what sort of politics we do? And he discuss- studied that, uh, looking at the Greek examples of the, uh, the fourth century BC with brilliance. And he makes the point that a, a stable democratic constitution requires an independent, self-confident middle class. And the reason I think for that, is, one way of thinking about that, is they know that individually they're not powerful enough to protect themselves. So they need the protection of uh, independent institutions of law um, of the state, um, and they need to defend those, and they need to make them work. And the and uh, and uh, in ad- in addition, um, uh, that makes them, as it were, concerned about acting together collectively in the political sphere. Um, but they are independent enough at the same time to feel that they don't have to rely on some charismatic figure, uh, some great uh, aristocrat to protect them. They, they can, once they act together, they can do it themselves. So the middle class, as he, call them, he calls them the middle people, are essential. Now, I argue that the great thing that capitalism did with immense struggles and hard work, and uh, it was not natural, is create an economy uh, which generated partly naturally and partly because of the forces it unleashed in society, a thriving and powerful middle class. And that middle class was the backbone of the democratic states that emerged in the course of the 20th century. Um, and uh, and which of which of course the US was a profound example and the and the uh, what has happened since that period over the last 40 50 years is the hollowing out of the middle class um a, a, a 
very prosperous upper middle class, a uh, immensely wealthy plutocracy, and uh, compression of the, you know, the, of the uh, movement of quite a large number of people who thought of themselves as stable and prosperous middle class people towards the bottom, which terrified them because they they felt economically insecure and also socially and culturally insecure. And I think the profound changes in the, our cultural values have also affected these people. And this hollowing out uh, of the middle uh, was generated in, this is a long analysis in my book, by both economic forces and the political forces, those economic forces unleashed, in particular the increasing capture of the political process uh, by plutocrats. Um, and you can see this very clearly, it seems to me, in the American case, by a long sequence of judicial decisions which increase the power of money in politics. And this um, created some quite interesting new coalitions. Um, uh, and here, I think something happened which it still is a bit of a surprise to me, but I argue this is something we've seen many times. You mentioned what happened in Europe in the middle of the 20th century. We saw it, of course, we talked about southern politics. Essentially, an alliance emerges between parts of the plutocracy, like in the southern case, the plantocracy, demagogic politicians, and the angry, downwardly mobile, or fearing downwardly mobile middle. Uh, who particularly resent the people below them, who think they are, um, who they think are trying to usurp them, and they resent also parts of the intelligentsia who are seen from their point of view to attack both their cultural values and to support the people below them. And in the, of course, racial elements are important here, whom uh, they want to keep, but to keep below them. It's pretty clear. And this coalition, the demagogy of the the right, uh, you can see in different versions across the Western world now. Um, and it is very similar, unfortunately, in its social composition to the coalitions that formed in the fascist era, which you described, though there are many, many other differences. And I think that represented the product in sizable part of a failure to give a significant proportion of the old middle classes, uh, the, the blue-collar workers, and people like that, that sense of security and place, both culturally and economically, um, that they had enjoyed in the middle of the 20th century, particularly during the New Deal era, and, um, and created new forms of politics, radically new forms of politics, part of which with the sorts of politics we now see with DeSantis and with Trump and so forth, based around culture and a racial element, uh, a, an autocratic element, an anti-intellectual element, which um, in which economics plays, I think, a very significant, um, very significant uh, role. And it's, I call it following out of the middle. Now, the... the um, the raunchy capitalism element is significant because what is important is that while there has been very substantial technical progress uh, and obviously very substantial change, the overall performance of economies hasn't been that good. And more important, in a number of countries of which the US is a particularly important example, a very large part of the winnings accrued to a relatively small proportion of the population at the top. And, uh, and that, I think, is part of, a very significant part of this um, sense of the middle, that they are not being properly treated. What's interesting here is that the complete failure to create anything like the old um, New Deal coalition uh, uh, in the current circumstances, uh, it, as it were, the failure of the centre-left, almost universally, to create a coalition of hope. And the way I think about this, let me just end up this, is in any situation of stress of this kind, there are the politics of hope and the politics of fear. 
This seems to me a sort of standard thing we've seen. And if people don't believe in the politics of hope, they basically buy into the message that government can't do anything, that government is going to be completely unsuccessful in making anything better, then the alternative is the politics of fear. And the and I think one of the most important developments in the US and in the West more broadly, which I didn't emphasize, I think, enough about um, in the book, is the successful argument over decades that government cannot do anything that makes anything better. So the, the reverse of the New Deal message or the social democratic message. And if government can't do anything to make your life better, well, at least you can repress the people who are trying to make it worse. And that seems to me what the politics of the new right, the nationalist right, promising. And the other side of this new politics is that it's intensely tribal. Uh, it's about our tribe against other tribes. These are identity politics, and that's grew on, I think, quite generally. And in tribal politics, politics which are built around identity and culture, not economics, then, of course, what you need is somebody who feels like a tribal leader, and a tribal leader will never give quarter. A tribal leader is unambiguously always on your side. So if you've got a dominant politics of fear against hope and a dominant politics of tribalism, then the emergence, I think, of the demagogue, the right-wing demagogue, as a central figure in politics, and you're seeing this all across the, uh, the world, is completely natural. Yeah, it's almost as if the the failure of modern capitalism, at least in the last 40 years, to produce a shared prosperity has resulted in the rise of these, as you mentioned in the book, these other, el- these other ways in which polit- political battles are being fought out, identity and culture and whatnot. They are closely related, yes. Yeah. And it's only natural that if, like neither side, I think what, what I was trying to get to is that neither side has credibility on the economy because they've all been in power over time in the in this 40 years and it's, it's just getting worse and worse for the middle class. And so that's why the, the fight has shifted because no one can stand up there and say that they actually have a plan to stop the debt-fueled overconsumption in America and the financial instability caused by overspeculation and all the problems, the economic problems, which you so uh, articulate in, in your book so well, um, it's kind of uh, led us to this impasse where we can't even talk about the new New Deal, which I, I love that idea in your book. I feel I'm particularly inspired by that kind of politics myself. I feel like if a, if a politician in America had the guts to get up there and articulate some of these ideas, maybe they would be listened to. But I do, I do as someone who deals with the government myself a lot as a real estate developer, I sort of understand your other point, which is government's not doing a great job in America, for sure, as in terms of making the citizens feel like they're out on their behalf. So I, I see how this is all coming together in this crazy moment. Well, let's take an example, which is one of the most extraordinary in, in America, um, which I discuss only briefly, but it's your health system. So um, government is all over it, but its main impact is to make it more expensive. Uh, It's perfectly obvious if you look at it, there are simply staggering rents being extracted from the health system in drug prices, in, in hospital charges, in the profits of entities. And um Given the results of your health system, which are among the poorest in the world in terms of life expectancies, for instance, and other morbidities, um, it's quite easy to argue, since the health system costs about 18 or 19 percent of GDP, which is a lot. It's the biggest industry in America. um, And if you compare it with other countries, Probably something like seven percentage points of GDP, which is a staggering number, are being are being extracted as rents by participants in this system, um, and it's probably uh, you know, it, that's uh, uh, what's, what's that? That's uh, one point seven trillion dollars, something like that. I don't. This is off the back of my head. Yeah. 
And I think, and the same, similar things are clearly going on in the financial sector, perhaps not on the same scale. Uh, um, then there's the problems, as I point out, of failure to uh, to ensure that wealthy people pay taxes for a whole host of reasons. Yeah, the the system has been rigged, and uh, and if you're a good capitalist and believe in Adam Smith, he would say that's exactly what you have to avoid. I mean, he he, you know, he, he believed that it has to be com- competition. So that's one of my big themes. You know, it's not a capitalism that works in the way we think capitalism ought to work. And the examples I've given are just a few of them, but they are very big. And that's true, even though, which is also very true, there are some immense strengths in innovation in the U.S. and a remarkable progress uh, occurring at the at the same time. But it's pretty clear a large proportion of the population does not feel that this is really benefiting them as they hoped and wished, and their children's prospects are quite possibly worse than theirs. Yep. I think that sums up exactly the, the sentiment here in America. You know, I'm a father myself. My kids are privileged just because of our, you know, circumstances in life. We've been fortunate, but I, I know from talking to people across the country that the fundamental issue here is that America is based on this idea of of the American dream. And, and it changes over times and whatnot, but ultimately the idea of the American dream is not that complicated. It's what you just said, which is, do the kids have a better chance than the parents had? And if the answer is yes, then the American dream is alive. And if the answer is no, then you get to a moment like we live in today where there's a huge chunk of this country who don't believe the American dream has anything to do with them. And it's a consequence of, of ultimately a bunch of failed um, economic policies and that have manifested in political ways over time, like housing, for example, housing, America is supposed to be about housing, but the housing market is broken, completely unaffordable. It's start, everywhere is starting to feel like London and Hong Kong and all these other places you can't. And America is, is skewing on these lines of, do you own a home or not? If you own a home, you love America because you're, you're in the haves and haves not. If you don't own a home, you hate it, that, that, which is kind of crazy. Well, another example, which I actually discovered today, is the staggering inflation and the cost of going to university. And, and um, so many, many people must feel sending their kids to a top-class university, which remains one of the entry points into successful life. We you know, education is more and more important, really. Um, it's just unaffordable, and then that gets you into the issue of student debt, and um, which I also write about. So America has great, great strengths, but I think it is very difficult for the middle middle classes to feel that's really terribly relevant to them. So um, they give up, or they get involved in politics, and. Uh, they, as I said, if you don't have hope, you go for fear and anger, and and that that is a mobilizing force that one one can never under underestimate. And I think that is a large part of what's happening now. I actually think that this is the view from across the Atlantic, so maybe irrelevant that sort of Biden gets this and would like to do something, but it's very very hard to do it. You know, the relatively limited time with the with the means he has at his disposal, it's like turning around a super tanker. Uh, uh, in and I think it is important, as you indicate, that the parties that the, you know, the centre left, if you like, broadly the Democrats, don't seem as relevant to the, the plight of ordinary people as they did in the thirties and forties, uh, and that's also a uh, a big issue. So it may be too late to To make the the necessary changes to convince people that something different can emerge. And the final point I would make: it is genuinely difficult because, as I pointed out in my book, uh, the there are economic changes that have happened that really make a, a widely shared prosperity more difficult. And the most important of these are one, you know. The emerging developing world is emerging and developing, and there, that changes competition. We don't have a monopoly of know-how that we had half a century ago. And the second thing is basically all the 
underlying technological developments of our society are in the direction of favoring highly skilled and particularly highly educated people. And the the old industrial working class, which was such an important bastion of stability in middle class societies of Rome, has eroded everywhere because factories, we don't have factories like that, and they don't employ people like that in the way they used to. And what we needed to do was work harder to counteract these forces. And instead, we basically decided to leave it all to, to this form of market economy, as we described it. And lots of people um, ended up with far worse opportunities than they'd hoped and expected. Yep. Hoped for or expected. Yep. Sad but true. Well, I want to be cognizant. I know you've got to um, get home. I, I got one final question for you. Okay, let's go for the final question and we can. Okay. Um, what, you end the book on a point that I think is super important and, and one that I'm personally very inspired by. I've been writing about this a lot in my, um, my newsletter and putting it out there in the world, which is you know the antidote. One of the key components of your antidote to this crisis is the idea of civic virtue. And I, I feel like you know, I'm sort of working on a book, actually, that the, the title is like The Last Great Hope. And my thesis is that a resurgence of civic virtue in this country in particular is the, is the key to the survival of, of democracy and freedom in the world. And so I was super inspired when, when I got to the end of your book and, and you were talking about just that point. So I'd love to just get your take on that, you know, to end this really fun conversation. Well, I sometimes wonder whether I'm, uh, I'm incredibly naive, uh, because, you know, economics always overwhelms these things. But, uh, it's pretty, it seems to me sort of basic, uh, that, um, if you're going to run a society which is based on the intrinsically Egalitarian principles of democracy. We're all citizens together. And uh, in a society which is nonetheless not equal, because our economy pretty well ensures that, and in fact, this is the complicated relationship we have, then there must be some set of values that everybody shares despite the uh the um uh, the inequalities and differences in their position and status in society and and i think the the core of that has to be responsibility to and for one another that is to say we are all citizens in this political community it is a community uh, because we accept certain constraints and restraints on our activities in the interest of preserving this republic, the republican institutions. And uh, that means that if we are in positions of power and influence, we have an obligation to um, be concerned in what we do uh, in politics and in society about the position and the opportunities of others. And also, if even if you're not at the you know the top of society, but far from it, you have an obligation to be part of it, to be active, to be engaged, to to think that um, the political sphere, the, the what the social sphere, the, where you live, all these things are matters that are of importance to you. You're engaged in them. These are the fundamental virtues of. Uh, of uh, citizenship. I, I, my friend Richard Haas, former head of the Council of Foreign Relations, has recently written a book which is about uh, how rights must go with duties, with obligations. It, this applies, in my view, quite particularly to people at the top of society, uh, and uh, uh, but of course it has to apply throughout. Now, in the really successful dem democratic republics, which are, of course most believe be rather smaller than the US. The US is so big. Um, it's easier to have this because you know you are, you are so well, you're so much closer 
to the core of political power. I and mean, Switzerland is a wonderful example of this. Uh, even though it's very diverse because of different languages and so forth, they're very firmly Swiss and they've maintained this over many centuries. And it has a very good set of values of the type we mention, we're discussing. But I think that ultimately, uh, democracy is a moral venture. It is, of course, it's political and it sounds naive, but it is a moral venture. It is one in which we share the basic premise. We're not entitled to do whatever we want to seize power. The rules and restraints in this system are vital for, and must be defended. And we must be uh, all be concerned about the welfare of the whole and not just of ourselves or even our side. Um, and if we don't have that, we know democracy will die uh, because it's inherently, though very valuable and beautiful in my view, very fragile, because it's obviously fragile, uh, because it's just so easy to pervert and subvert it. And we've discussed how that can, can happen. Um, and I think, coming back to the Roman experience, a large part of what happened is that the elite became feral. They basically ceased to believe that anything mattered except their own power and their own wealth. And once you've got a society in which the people who control wealth believe that the only thing that matters is their own power and wealth, you're going to end up in a dictatorship in one form or another. Yeah. It's a sobering thought, but I, I think historic, historically it, there's a ton of evidence for it. And I, I think what concerns me so much about this country, but all democracies, is that we've gotten – like the world, the West has become so rich, at least for the, the people who are in the, in the have category that we've forgotten that a human being can be motivated by things beyond money. We've forgotten about morality and religion. God, God forbid we mention religion. But there are other motivators for human beings that are very, very powerful. And um, they're there waiting for, you know, waiting for someone to reach them, the you know, thinkers of the world, leaders of the world to reach them in a different way so that we can move beyond just the selfish acquisition of more and more money and power. So. I agree with that. The problem is that some of them, and it depends on how it's used, I think religion is incredibly important, but you can also end up with theocracy, which is what you really don't want. Definitely and, don't want that. And, uh, and uh, you can have some sort of socialist idealism and it ends up in dictatorship. The motto of my book is this Greek motto, Mervin Nagan, which means nothing in excess. Essentially, the point is that a, a liberal democratic society is a balance, involves a balance of forces between individualism and obligation to society as a whole, between the right to individual inquisition and enterprise and the sense that you're part of a broader political process. And um, you, we were wrong to allow, uh, to, to, to exaggerate and overemphasize the role of the free market. But we would be equally wrong to believe that government is all the solution. It's all about balance. I just think, for the reasons we've discussed at length, that our societies have got quite badly unbalanced. And because they're badly unbalanced, the, the political system really doesn't work very much well. And it has to be refurbished in the complicated ways. And I discussed many of them, maybe not sufficiently, uh, if it's going to endure. And we must do so because we have to recognize there's no God-given reason that our democracies will survive. They could perfectly well disappear. Yeah. Well, Martin, this is a great way to end it. Uh, thank you. The book is phenomenal. I'm, I'm recommending it to, to everybody. And I appreciate you being so generous with your time. I really enjoyed this conversation. You've taken me in directions I hadn't expected. And I haven't discussed the ancient world so much with anybody. And I very much appreciate it. Thank you very, very much. You're welcome. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for listening to The Nick Hilera Show. We hope you enjoyed the episode and would appreciate your help with spreading the word by sharing with your network on social. And until next time, remember, it's not about pursuing success to unlock fulfillment. It's about learning how to find fulfillment in the midst of success.